Greetings and salutations. My name is Andy Semler, and I will be discussing treatment options for managing the symptoms of complex post-traumatic stress disorder, hereafter abbreviated CPTSD. We will look at the causes and symptoms of CPTSD, explore the current guidelines for effective treatment with a closer look at a few of the specific elements recommended by experts, and address some of the current debate surrounding these guidelines. Recovery from complex post-traumatic stress disorder requires restoration of control and agency to the traumatized person through a phase-based approach that focuses on emotional skills building, processing trauma, and setting goals for the future. First, we will look at the causes of CPTSD. Many people are familiar with the popular image in the media of the soldier who experiences a violent, life-threatening situation and comes home traumatized. That would be the traditional understanding of PTSD. However, this is not the only form trauma can take in a person's life. Many people are traumatized within a more complex environment involving a sustained exposure to the threat on their well-being. They feel entrapped, helpless to escape or improve their situation, and over time become conditioned to view themselves as helpless, even in situations where there is no threat. The most studied example is child sexual abuse, where the development of healthy relationship skills is interrupted by trauma. Other situations in which a person can become trapped with their abusers include violent domestic relationships, being a prisoner of war or a refugee, being a victim of human trafficking, including slavery and prostitution, having a chronic illness that involves long-term suffering or painful medical treatments, and even involvement in particularly strict religious traditions or cults. The end result is that the trauma causes a disruption in development or a reconditioning of a person's sense of themselves and their placement in the world. Some of the symptoms of CPTSD overlap with PTSD, but the total complexity and severity goes above and beyond. This slide and the next contain a lot of technical terms, so let's look what they really mean. Prominent dissociation involves feeling estranged from oneself, from others, and from one's surroundings. This can even lead to episodes of amnesia. The difficulties with attention go above and beyond mere distraction to a profound difficulty to concentrate or understand a situation. Alterations in the regulation of affective impulses is a fancy way of saying that the person has difficulty managing anger, is impulsive, or is engaging in self-harm due to their inability to soothe intense negative emotional states. Somatization and medical problems can include chronic pain or other stress-related medical complications. The victim's perception of the perpetrator may be altered into a dysfunctional perception of or relationship with that person. As a result of this reconditioning, they may experience a general dysfunctional or avoidance of relationships. This involves a chaotic approach to or preoccupation with relationships in which they may feel they are unable to trust others or develop intimacy. They have come to view others as ultimately self-serving and out to take advantage of them through any means necessary. The internalization of abuse messages led to an altered self-perception in which their concept of self is dominated by feelings of guilt and shame and other utter worthlessness as a person. Their symptoms of meaning may be altered, resulting in a damaged belief system or feelings of being permanently negatively changed by the event. This can lead to a sense of hopelessness at finding someone who will understand them or despair of ever being able to recover. Since CPTSD is the prevention of development or the deterioration of emotional and relational skills, treatment seeks to build these skills in addition to processing the trauma itself. The International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies has developed guidelines for therapists which they update regularly based on their periodic reviews of research and their own surveys of therapeutic experts on CPTSD. They advocate a phase-based approach to treatment in which the patient first builds up emotional and relational skills, which equips them to deal with the trauma in a way they were previously unable to, before finally restructuring their life in a way that takes advantage of therapeutic gains. Treatment length is an aspect in need of further study, but it has been recommended at 9 to 12 months for the first two phases of treatment, 
with the third phase eventually tapering off over six months. Phase one of treatment is about stabilizing the patient emotionally, establishing a treatment plan, and building up emotional skills. The very first step is to address immediate safety concerns to the patient, address any suicidality or self-harm that may be present, discover unsafe elements in their environment that perpetuate trauma, and, if possible, remove the patient from these situations. If the patient must remain in a dangerous situation, establish a safety plan that takes advantages of social and community resources. Treatment plans for substance abuse, as well as prescribing medication, may be appropriate. Once the patient has been stabilized in this manner, the therapist can then educate them on many of the things I am including in this presentation. This psychoeducation will help them to better understand how trauma has impacted their development, that CPTSD is something they experience, not who they are as a person. Psychoeducation will also help them take an active role in developing a treatment plan tailored to their personal needs. Integrated with all of this is emotional and relational skills building, which I will go into more detail later on. Phase one is the longest and most important phase with some patients even able to continue improvement on their own after completion of this stage. As mentioned earlier, some of the symptoms of CPTSD include distrust of other people and a belief that people are fundamentally out to abuse or take advantage of the patient. This can make the patient particularly sensitive to any perceived negative attitudes or opinions from the therapist. The therapist must cultivate the therapeutic alliance most scrupulously in order to provide a safe environment for the patient to address their struggles and anxieties. Over time, the patient can come to trust their working relationship with the therapist and see that the potential for other relationships is possible. Skills training in affect and interpersonal regulation was designed specifically for the first phase of CPTSD treatment. It covers seven different areas of emotional and relational skills. Many people survive trauma by disconnecting themselves from overwhelming negative emotions. However, this sort of shutting down is not useful in normal situations where a wide range of emotional experiences is healthy. First, the patient needs to learn emotional awareness. The patient needs to learn how to name, understand, and describe emotions. Second, they can begin building skills to help them regulate uncomfortable emotions, bringing them into a manageable range. They can learn what coming mechanisms produce desired results and which are self-defeating. Third, they can learn how to engage with distressing situations in a productive way. Everyone experiences stress from time to time, and by learning to apply effective coping skills, the patient can regain a sense of control in their life. Now that they've built up internal skills, the next four steps focus on external applications in relationships with others. Again, the first step is to understand relationship patterns that play out in the patient's life and identify ways in which they have set up self-fulfilling interpersonal schemas. Second is to explore ways of interacting with others through role-playing interpersonal scenarios with the therapist. This is why the therapeutic alliance is so important. The patient must be able to trust that the therapy will not result in emotional harm caused by the therapist. The next step is to explore more challenging interactions in role-play allowing the patient to exercise agency and healthy boundary setting. Finally, the patient can use this gained sense of agency to adopt a flexible approach to relationships of many different varieties, no longer reproducing the same self-defeating patterns as before. Expert consensus and several trials agree that patients benefit from building up emotional skills that they are lacking in order to be better equipped to handle the stress of revisiting and processing trauma in phase two of the ISTSS treatment guidelines. Patients are more likely to drop out of therapy if forced to confront traumatic memories without first focusing on emotional skills development. As you can see in the graph, the yellow line denoting the group without STAIR experienced worse mood regulation during treatment, which is one possible cause for increased dropouts. You can also preview the importance of exposure therapy in phase two on sustained emotional gains. ISTSS guidelines indicate mindfulness as a possible supplement to professional therapy. There are five basic aspects to mindfulness which have been examined for effectiveness with dissociative aspects of PTSD and CPTSD. The most helpful aspect was non-reactivity, 
that is, the observation of one's own emotional states without being swept away by them. Describing, acting with awareness, and non-judging may also be beneficial. Observing, or the direction of one's focus to one's current physical state, should be avoided, as it may lead to a worsening of dissociative symptoms. After approximately six months at Phase 1, the patient may be ready to transition into Phase 2. Exposure therapy is what most people are familiar with as the treatment for traditional PTSD. This involves simulating the trauma or otherwise emotionally re-experiencing it through narration within a safe environment. The goal is to rework the patient's emotional response to the trauma in a way that is constructive to their sense of self. Exposure therapy is an important and effective part of a phase-based treatment plan. As you can see in the graph, the group that combined STARE with exposure therapy experienced sustained improvements in the six months following their exit of treatment. Exposure therapy often involves narration of the traumatic event in a safe environment or otherwise revisiting the trauma through symbolism or artistic expression. The purpose is to recondition the patient's emotional response to traumatic stimulus. The patient may experience grief, shame, or rage and spend much of phase two processing through these emotions. They may also take active steps to resolve traumatic situations or to set healthier boundaries with abusers. When following emotional skills building, the patient rarely experiences re-traumatization during the exposure process. Even still, the therapist should be vigilant for a sudden increase in symptom severity or even suicidality and return to phase one as needed for additional emotional skills building. Traumatized individuals often have fragmented memories of the situation and their self-narrative emphasizes their personal helplessness. Many times they get stuck in the past, unable to visualize a healthier future for themselves. The purpose of exposure therapy is to reintegrate the traumatic memory into one's autobiography in a way that is coherent and compassionate, using language that conve conveys resilience and transformation. For example, in my own life stories, I depict the trauma I have survived as constructive to how I become a stronger person today even while condemning those who have caused me harm. A coherent self-narrative gives the patient a sense of control over their life and sets a positive direction for their future. After having spent 9 to 12 months in phases 1 and 2, the patient may now proceed to phase 3. This is the opportunity for the patient to wrap up what they've learned so far and apply it toward their approach to the future. Some individuals with CPTSD may have never believed recovery was possible and so the idea of setting personal goals and working toward them is unfamiliar to them. Some possible areas in which they may create plans includes education and employment, recreation and hobbies, relationship and social support networks, and so on. This is also a time for the patient to identify any future therapeutic needs, such as identifying whether they need ongoing lower intensity treatment and how they would know if they need any booster sessions in the future as necessary. There has been some pushback against CPTSD as a distinct form of PTSD since the concept was first introduced in the 1990s. Many PTSD experts don't think the additional symptoms proposed for CPTSD are sufficient to warrant a separate diagnosis, instead seeing it as regular old PTSD taken to a more extreme level. Compared to the traditional approach to PTSD, the ISTSS phase-based approach may draw treatment out longer than necessary for safe, effective treatment, thus delaying recovery. There is also some concern that presenting the patient with an overly cautious, gradual approach may send the message that they're an especially fragile person, thus reinforcing their feelings of hopelessness. The most recent version of the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders was released in 2013. The field trials for the DSM-5 found that most individuals with CPTSD also could be diagnosed with PTSD. CPTSD was therefore rejected for inclusion, and PTSD was instead broadened to consider more symptoms for diagnosis. Part of this has been due to a lack of CPTSD-specific research which itself is due to a lack of inclusion in the DSM, a cycle that can be difficult to break out of. There remains the possibility for future editions of the DSM to portray trauma disorders as a spectrum, along which PTSD and CPSD would exist. In response to the claim that a phase-based approach takes too long, 
the ISTSS experts point us back to the evidence I presented earlier showing the higher dropout rate for patients of exposure therapy that was not preceded by stair motion skills building. PTSD treatments on the whole have notoriously poor success rates of reducing symptoms in general, so the entire field could benefit from development of improved methods. Regarding the lack of distinction in the DSM-5, the newly broadened symptom list for PTSD is now so broad that there are 636,120 ways to have a disorder that qualifies for DSM-5 diagnosis. This actually makes it more difficult for therapists to diagnose, let alone come up with an effective personalized treatment plan. The distinction between CPTSD and PTSD is proposed for the 2017 edition of the World Health Organization's International Classification of Diseases in accordance with several studies and the opinions of over 1,700 experts worldwide. In conclusion, CPTSD is a more complex disorder requiring a more extensive course of treatment than traditional PTSD. A phase-based approach tailored to the individual symptoms is best, focusing on building emotional and relational skills before revisiting and desensitizing traumatic memories. The goal of recovery from CPTSD is the restoration of control and agency to the traumatized person. If you want to learn more, I highly recommend visiting the National Center for PTSD on the VA's website. They maintain up-to-date resources for providers and patients alike.